Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. This is my first lecture on philosopher Jesse Prinz's. Uh, the book is called uh, The Conscious Brain, and the article here is called Is Attention Necessary and Sufficient for Consciousness? I'm going to do two lectures. This is going to be a lot of setup, a lot of background to get us all uh, prepared to do the really technical, fine-grained um, argument that we get in the second lecture. Um, so some of these pictures and some of the uh, points I'm going to make today, you, you should be getting familiar with them. That's okay. I have uh, used or, or prepped us during the course of the semester with some of these ideas. And the reason I was peppering some of our earlier discussions with some of these ideas, like this diagram, for instance, is so that we could set up and explain Prince's argument. Okay, so um, this little diagram or this picture of a uh, neural hierarchy lets us uh, make uh, an important distinction between low level and high level representation at the neural discrimination level. So um, you could imagine that some of the neurons in the bottom right hand side are part of um, early low-level uh, visual processing in the brain system and these are neurons that have very simple uh, discrete tasks that they um, are dedicated to they just for instance just detect vertical edges or horizontal edges we know for a fact that there are lots of neurons like this in the visual cortex um, whose job it is is just to look for vertical lines or horizontal lines and that's pretty much all they do and so whenever something like that is present in the field of vision and it's making its way into the neural system then those neurons will start firing like mad their neighbors uh, uh, further downstream, the um, you know we might call them um, more higher level representers and more higher level neurons in the hierarchy, then wait to hear from uh, conjoint signals from lots of the other uh, neurons that pre preceded them. And ultimately, as you work your way up the neural hierarchy to the top, you get a neuron whose job it is more or less or very roughly speaking, its job it is, is to notice when there's a table present. Now we don't have single neurons that are dedicated to finding tables. Um, this is a grossly oversimplified picture, but the idea is that when you get this compound, uh, compounded, tiered, or hierarchical uh, sets of discriminations, and they start con compounding together and getting combined, because a vertical edge combined with a horizontal edge means there's a corner, so you get these hierarchies of neurons that can recognize more and more complicated objects with more and more features embedded in them. So for our purposes, the ones on the bottom are the low-level representers and the ones on the top are the high-level representers. We need that idea of tiered hierarchical representation to understand what Prinz is going to argue for with regard to organization. So the activation of horizontal edge detector by itself is not an organized awareness of the object. I mean, even when that table neuron is firing, that need not uh, amount to attention or consciousness of a table. Um, I only give you the diagram just to show how you might, uh, dis might uh, distribute the discriminatory task and then um, make a complicated representational task built up out of um, much simpler, dumber, um, simple uh, procedures uh, when we compound them together to get the higher level. So a verbal report, for example, if we were referring back to Dehane and Akash, um, a verbal re report of, for somebody to be able to say something like, oh, that's an edge, um, and report on what that low-level neuron is, is detecting would require engaging many more systems and be a much higher level representation than the mere work of that neuron or even the table neuron here because you'd have to get it over to um, broadcast it over to verbal centers and speech uh, in, in memory and all kinds of other modules in the brain. So like I said, very oversimplified, but it introduces the idea of low-level versus high-level representation. Okay, now let me expand on that. Here's a famous... Um, <clears throat> This is from a famous study that Christoph Cook and a few other important neuroscientists um, were engaged in. I've talked about this one before, too. Um, now I want to talk about it a little more specifically, a little more technically. So what they found was this was an epilepsy patient that they had a lot of um, um, uh, uh, little metal detectors 
um, actually uh, um, embedded down into her brain. And one of the, uh, they were trying to detect and figure out where the epilepsy, uh, epileptic attacks were originating. But, but, but one of the th things they did while they were monitoring this patient and some others was they showed her a whole big battery of different pictures and tried to see and tried to map where some neural activity was happening. And what they found was famously the, the Halle Berry neuron. So um, you can see my little arrow here points to um, some neural activity that they've spiked. They've shown that there was a spike at that little um, place on the range of electrical, acti electrical activity. Now what's important here is that um, picture number 22 and picture number 24 and picture number 52 and picture number 96 on the right, they all triggered that same neuron. Now partly what's important here is that <clears throat> Look at um, the content of picture number 24. The image is not very good, but it's a face-on shot of Halle Berry um, with short hair. And what is in the content of picture number 96? That's the words Halle Berry. Okay, so uh, you can imagine then that the... Um, wherever this neuron happens to be in that vast hierarchy of uh, neural representations, um, it's going to be very high. It's going to be very abstract um, because uh, on the surface of it, like there's, we're not talking about vertical or, or horizontal edges here. We're talking about representing or, or discriminating something really abstract and recognizing that these words stand for the same thing as that picture stands for, and it's this person, this woman with the name Halle Berry. So there's some pretty high level, um, pretty advanced, um, high level representation going on here if, uh, for this neuron. Now, there were some low level uh, horizontal or vertical edge detector neurons engaged in this activity too, but this is that's not the activity that we were monitoring in this study. They just discovered this neuron that's operating very um, at the very abstract level. Okay, so from Prinz's perspective, this is going to be a very high level representation, and what we're after is intermediate level representation. That's going to be important in a minute. So this particular neuron is involved in the representation of Halle Berry in a wide range of varied abstract visual and linguistic cases. Okay, so <clears throat> Prinz's argument, the thesis he's pressing for, um, stated uh, relatively simply and relatively untechnically at this stage is to say that consciousness is an intermediate level representation. What we're after is um, the sort of consciousness that you have when you represent whole objects that are rich with surface detail, located in depth, and presented from a particular point of view. Okay, that's vague, it's deliberately um, ambiguous. Prince has got a lot of work to do to unpack what that means and be more specific about it. And he's going to locate a position in here right in the midst of all these other positions we've been looking at, like Dennett's, uh, uh, Dehane and Nakash, uh, Christoph Cook, and some of the others. <clears throat> Okay, so let me introduce some other ideas here. Um, one of the important concepts we've got to think about and got to operate with in this uh, context is something called the neural correlate of consciousness, or the NCC. There are thought to be particular neural events that correlate with the occurrence of conscious awareness of a subject when it's conscious awareness of the sort that, that Prinz is trying to put his finger on. Uh, that is, there's neurons that are firing, or there's some sort of neural activity or neural correlates that match up with what it is to be conscious of that thing. Um, so when the subject has conscious awareness, whatever that might be, of some object X, then those neural events are occurring, and when the subject is not having the conscious awareness of X, those neural events are not occurring. So the correlates are present. That's what it means to say it's, it's correlates, um, that, that these neural, neural events are present um, you know, when Halle Berry's present and not present when she's not. Um, a central project in, the neuro in neuroscience has been to determine what and where the NCCs are generally for conscious awareness. And Prinz is using a lot of that empirical research to try to triangulate and narrow down just what aspects of consciousness and where they located in the brain um, and what sort of um, 
features are we going to include in our account of consciousness and which ones are we not? Um, that's ultimately how we get to this AIR theory of consciousness. Okay, so just to expand on this notion of neural correlates of consciousness, I've talked about the Necker cube before. That's this famous diagram. So when you look at the picture on the left, you can first be aware of the lower left square as the leading face. So you can look at the image on the left and visualize it or think of it or be conscious of it as if it's the bottom right hand um, image where I've got the upper, um, the upper right uh, square is the leading edge. Um, I've got to describe this in language, but you, when you look at it, you can do it. And one of the interesting things here is that I can look at the line diagram and I can flip. I can shift um, what I'm aware of at my conscious level and I can see the cube one way and then I can see the cube the other way. I can flip it back and forth. I can flip from one uh, image to the other. Okay, so you can switch your awareness. That's a kind of top-down direction, Prince would say, to seeing the upper right square as the leading face. So question, <clears throat> if everything else were kept the same in your sensory environment, and imagine we put you in a, a really good fMRI scanner, what would be the neural events that correspond with you switching your awareness from seeing that Necker cube one way, then the other, then the other way, then the other way? Imagine that we had a uh, neural scanning equipment or technology that could capture down to say, you know, um, the neural, you know, which neurons are firing. Now we did it in that Halle Berry study, but with, all they did there was just, they just put about 200 of these little sensors into this woman's brain. You know, there's billions of neurons. Imagine we could um, image or capture the activity in real time of all the neurons activity and then we could steadily you know we put you into the system and then we have you go okay um, uh, imagine from 10 you know for the first five seconds we want you to, to uh, imagine or vision or be conscious of the Necker cube one way and then we want you to switch and then switch back and then switch back again and if we could eliminate all the noise and get out all of the other neural events, because there's all this other activity going on, there's lots of other um, things happening in your brain, there's all kinds of unconscious activities, you know, you're, you're monitoring your heart rate and your adrenaline levels and, and your amygdala is doing all this stuff. We, we eliminate all of that other stuff and we just find the neural events that correlate with you flipping from seeing the Necker cube one way to the other. That's a kind of hy hypothetical uh, way, a case, where we would be zeroing in on the so-called neural correlates of consciousness. Okay, so those would be the NCCs, and Prinz is curious about what those are from the empirical neuroscientific perspective. Um, to what extent can we use um, clever studies on the empirical side to uh, uh, uncover where and how the brain is doing this stuff? And then um, from the subjective philosopher side, what can I do when I reflect on or analyze and argue um, and try to figure out how does that map or match or inform the way I'm having my moment-to-moment -moment experience. And you'll see here that, that what's really amazing is that Prinz uses the empirical research and this kind of, you know, uh, Dennett would have called it heterophenomenology, um, that Prinz uses sort of philosophical analysis and empirical research to sort of bootstrap his way up to a place where he can go, okay, here's a, uh, an aspect of consciousness that's very hard to talk about, and, and we, but we want to isolate just that part, and that's the part we're talking about. That's the part we need a theoretical account of. Okay, so that's going to be the AIR theory, and we'll get to that soon here in, uh, in the second lecture. Okay, so... Um, Prinz is going to argue then that intermediate level representations correspond to the contents of experience, and that's going to map onto attention. So we need a theory of what goes on when perceptual states at the low level, imagine those vertical or horizontal edge detectors, come to be consciously experienced. And we've already seen one account of this. We've seen the global workspace model that says consciousness just is global availability. Prinz is going to argue for a slightly different um, position here that he thinks fits better with the empirical data. Once we locate the right brain regions and events, we need to figure out what kinds of processes in those regions correspond to conscious experience.
Okay, so the answer ultimately uh, to that question will be consciousness arises when and only when we attend. Uh, so attention is going to be the, the phenomena, the, you know, take the folk psychological notion of attention that you've got pre-theoretically, you, you sort of, you know, when I say, hey, pay attention, or it's hard to pay attention when I'm taking a, a, a class online, or, or uh, my, I'm distracted or whatever, you get your folk psychological account of what it is to have attention, and Prinz is going to use that and say, okay, yeah, attention, it turns out, he thinks is a thing, and it does map on to some of this neural uh, research, and he's going to tighten and sharpen our account of exactly what that is. Okay, so he's going to argue that attention is necessary and sufficient for consciousness. Um, what does that mean? I'll just give a quick example just so you can kind of keep clear in your head. What does it mean to say something's necessary and sufficient? So let me give you an example of something that's necessary but not sufficient. Um, that is, being a human is necessary but not sufficient condition for being the president of the United States. So at a minimum, you have to have that, but it's not enough to succeed. Um, so uh, what's an example of something that's necessary and sufficient? Well, in, the necessary and sufficient conditions for being president of the United States is going to capture all and only um, the uh, properties of, pres of the president. So being a natural born citizen of the U.S., uh, being at least 35 years of age, having lived in the U.S. for at least 14 years, uh, being elected by the process described in the Constitution. If you've got all of those, um, if you've satisfied all of those conditions, that's necessary and sufficient. You can be, uh, so there's nothing extra, nothing, um, uh, nothing short. Uh, what about an example of a case where, so, where something's a sufficient condition but not necessary? Well, um, winning the lottery is sufficient to make you rich, but it's not necessary. There's other ways to uh, uh, acquire or uh, being rich or other ways to become rich. Okay, so that's just my two minutes on necessary and sufficient conditions. So what's happening is that Prinz is trying to put a very tight connection between attention and consciousness. Attention is necessary and sufficient for consciousness. Um, that defines consciousness for uh, Prinz. <clears throat> but of course, we've got to unpack what that means. Okay, so consciousness happens with attention. Um, so let's uh, start to triangulate then and and fine-tune or adjust or sharpen um, some of the concepts that we're using in this case. Okay, so what about so-called unconscious perceptions? Um, so on Prince's account, a subject has an unconscious perception of P when exposure to P has a measurable causal effect on the subject's performance on some task, but the subject does not have introspective, reportable awareness of the expo exposure to P. So you should be familiar with this now. This corresponds, um, I think, pretty well with with Dehane and Nakash's notion of C0 consciousness. Um, I called this perception before. I was following the prints on that. Some people don't like the term perception because it need not be um, sensory, uh, this phenomena, but we're just going to call it perception for now. So it can happen that there are these um, uh, events or stimuli that are present in your environment and your system, your cognitive system then registers them and it has a causal effect on them, but you're not aware of them at the conscious level. So they're unconscious perceptions. Um, and there's lots of great uh, research here that, that teases out and identifies these. There's been a, just an amazing body of literature come out that identifies um, things like this case. Pictures of faces that are angry, happy, or neutral for a mere 16 milliseconds. So uh, 50 milliseconds is about the bare minimum that you need to be to be conscious or have sort of C1 awareness of something. Um, 16 is not something you'd even know that you saw. I could be flashing images at you right now on this computer screen at 16 milliseconds and you wouldn't be able to report on them or no. And if you follow those by a mask, um, it actually influenced how much people say they're willing to pay for a soft drink that's given to them. So if you show them a flash of an angry face, um, it has one effect on them. You show them a happy face, it has another effect on them, which seems to lend some credence to this old um, urban myth about um, uh, movie theaters flashing images at you to get you to buy more popcorn. Um, and then the best one, you're wondering what my picture is about. Um, in this study in 2008, they found that unconsciously smelling fart spray can lead people to make harsher moral judgments than they would otherwise make. So I don't know how they, uh, one, one point here is that uh, these unconscious perceptions happen across all, all sense modalities, not just vision. 
and um, I don't know how they controlled the, the 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 amount of time. Maybe it wasn't about time, um, but the people couldn't report and didn't know they had smelled something bad. But it showed a measurable, demonstrable effect on their moral judgments, and even better, it made them uh, meaner. It made them more harsh, um, uh, harsh about judging. So um, if you uh, end up in um, a jury trial uh, as a defendant and um, they're about to do the sentencing, uh, better hope nobody's got gas. Uh, okay, so what's the difference between conscious and unconscious perceiving? Um, Prins, like everybody else here, talks about blindsight, which, uh, which I've talked about several times in class, and it comes up very often. So here's an example of um, this famous case of this guy who's got blindsight. So this guy has um, had two strokes um, that's left him cortically blind with no evidence of neural activity in the visual lobes. So the, the actual brain regions are dead, but when they put him to this task of walking down the hall and finding his way through this set of obstacles they put out there, um, he, does a, he does a very good job of navigating around the different objects. So he doesn't have any problem with that. He can um, find his way around the various objects that are on the floor. So the retinal cells also project to subcortical areas, and there's, there's technical stuff going on there. But what's important is that um, when you ask this guy, what did you see, or how many fingers am I holding up, or um, how did you know to step left or step right there in the hall when you were at that stage in the hall, he can't tell you that there was a trash can there. He can't report on it, and he, doesn't, he feels, ironically, amazingly, he feels blind. Um, at the conscious level, it feels as if he can't see anything, but something's seen. There's some low-level processing going on there. Now, Prinz says that this is not the sort of case he's after. He says blindsight isn't the kind of um, empirical research we're after because we're trying to figure out, um, trying to locate and identify attention and locate um uh, representation in various levels and he says look blindsight isn't what we're after because people with this disorder cannot recognize objects in their blind fields even on implicit measure measures okay so um, we're after uh, figuring out what consciousness is at some higher level we want to know um, what is it to recognize that an object is an object. Um, so blindsight doesn't give us that. Um, this guy's clearly registering something at some low level, but he can't report on it and he's not um, processing the object as an object. He seems to be just stepping around these things. Um, this suggests that they are not perceiving these objects in the sense under consideration. We want this richer, more robust uh, awareness of objects representing those objects as such, and they are not using the full extent of their visual processing hierarchies in response to those objects. Something more low level is going on. We need a condition in which objects are in fact recognized in the absence of consciousness. Um, could we find a case like that? And what Prinz ends up saying is that cases of unilateral neglect, um, where people have had this brain damage on one side of the brain that's that's made it hard for them to recognize stuff on the left-hand side of their visual field, those kinds of cases give him what he's after. Um, these are injuries to the right inferior, inferior parietal cortex. So if you damage the right side of the brain, it affects stuff you can do on the left in your sensory uh, field. And these people seem to be blind on the left-hand side, um, but they perceive the objects unconsciously. Um, that is, unilateral neglect patients insist that these two houses are exactly the same. You show them this diagram of these houses and say, do you see anything different about these two houses? What do these houses look like? Um, and they will report, oh, those two houses look exactly the same. Which, of course, they're not. One of them's on fire on the left, but that's part of the stuff that, that's the side that's, that's blind to this person at that level. Um, so you ask them a question. Well, okay, so they're both the same. Which one of these houses would you choose to live in if you had to choose? And the unilateral neglect patients will say, I'd rather live in the top one. And they can't tell you why, even if you ask them, why do you prefer the top one? They'll say, oh, it just seems nice, or they'll, make, they'll confabulate something. They can't tell you that the bottom one's on fire, but something's going on there that seems to be registered. Um, so they're aware of the objects as an object. The person's aware of the house as a house, but they can't tell you that that one's on fire and that that's going on there. Here's another case. Um, unilateral neglect cases in this instance, when you show them all of these horses, right? So we've got a regular horse, uh, something that's half cow, half horse, a half horse, and a half bicycle horse. Um, these, these patients, UN patients, claim that these horses are all identical. 
So you ask them, okay, well, which one's the most realistic horse? Or which one would, would you prefer to ride or something like that? And they will say, oh, I like the first one the best. They can't tell you why, but they do like that one best. So they can recognize that it's a horse and they can say that they're all identical, but they can't get to this important detail or feature there. Okay, so that matters. Um, uh, so uh, blind sight cases, uh, unilateral neglect cases, and now one other kind of, uh, another couple other kinds of, uh, of empirical evidence here that helps Prins narrow down um, to the kind of consciousness he's after and focusing on this notion of attention. So this phenomena that I'm about to describe is called attentional blink. So imagine that you take a person and you show them all of these cards with with words on them in order from top to bottom. So you and then the the thing on the right is shows how long you show it to them. So you show them the first card for 500, 500 milliseconds, the second card for 500 milliseconds, and then for all of the others you show them for 110 milliseconds. Manage input orgasm barrel brown compare. Then you wait for a thousand milliseconds and then you ask them what was the color word that you just saw now when you stick what's important here is that we want to, we want you to watch these words in succession and then when you're prompted identify the color term that you saw in that sequence of words now here's the trick um, when the critical distractor and the word that's the, the critical distractor in this case is orgasm it, when it's emotionally laden, subject performance goes down. That is, your ability to say that the color term I saw was brown is brown um, goes down. You start missing that word if I stick that if we stick that orgasm word in there in the midst of the others. Right? That pulls, that draws your attention and gets us to the processing going. It it pulls your ability to perform this task um, off from being able to succeed at the color identification case. So what Prin says is these kinds of examples of this empirical research of attentional blink um, shows that emotionally charged words attract attention. They pull attention over to that phenomenon as you're sort of now you know, attending to and paying attention to the fact that this is something about orgasms and it disrupts conscious perception. It, it interferes with your ability to say that the word you saw was brown. Um, it spills over and I suspect that what happens is that if you move that critical distractor um, further away from the target color word in time, probably performance on identifying the color word goes up um, because the attention can be pulled, moved back and you can get your, your focus or your attention back on the topic back on the task that's been given to you uh, okay so attention then uh, Prinz argues is needed for consciousness unilateral neglect at the inattentional blindness and attentional blink um, show that attention is needed for consciousness so I've realized I haven't put anything in here about uh, inattentional blindness. I will send you to uh, Prinz's discussion in that probably section 1.2 where he talks about it. Um, so those show that attention is needed for consciousness. That is to say, inferior parietal brain areas are correlated with attention and the location of impaired function in these patients. So it looks like we're narrowing in on where attention is happening or one of the crucial um, areas in which uh, some of these uh, uh, vital attention neural activities are happening is in that inferior inferior parietal brain areas. When attention is withdrawn, either due to brain injury, that's the unilateral neglect case, bottom-up capture, or top-down allocation to a demanding task, stimuli that are presented in clear view become invisible. Okay, so his, his idea is that um, these studies all have something to do with each other. Um, they're all um, interfering with or revealing um, the role that attention plays in bringing something into, uh, into conscious awareness. In each case, the unconscious stimuli show priming effects, suggesting that they are represented at all levels of the visual hierarchy. Mere activation at the intermediate level is not enough. Uh, that is, um, you have to be able to attend and um, boost up this um, 
level of cognitive processing in order for it to become more. And he's going to then talk about what attention is and what follows in the rest of our lecture. Okay, so that's all I'm going to set up just to get us going for uh, Prinz, um, the lecture part one, that we have low, intermediate, and high level representations and their neural correlates, and we're trying to identify and, and triangulate on what those are. Attention, he's going to argue, is necessary and sufficient for consciousness, and he's argued here that unilateral neglect, inattentional blindness, and attentional blink show that attention is needed for consciousness. And this, what's coming here is something he calls AIR theory of consciousness. What AIR stands for is that consciousness is attended intermediate representations.